February 1942, as the Dutch light cruiser De Ruyter steamed through the night in the Badung Strait. The collective tension among the crew manifested in the creaks and murmurs of the ship. In the distance, on the horizon, some pointed to the looming silhouettes of Japanese destroyers Asashio and Oshio. A sailor's heartbeat quickened, sensing the gravity of the impending clash. Orders were barked and guns readied. The vessel sailed headlong into the unknown as the Battle of the Badong Strait was about to break out. In the early 20th century, Japan rapidly developed, adopting new technologies for increased productivity and a stronger global position. Modeling its army and navy after Europe, Japan faced rising tensions with European nations and embarked on the conquest of Southeast Asia. The Empire of the Rising Sun annexed territories including Formosa, Korea, and parts of Manchuria. With Japan's economic growth came increased trade with the Dutch East Indies. A third of goods imported by the Dutch East Indies from Japan were used. Japan had made various attempts to secure more resources from the Dutch East Indies, leading to criticism from the Dutch, suspecting territorial expansion. Measures such as tariffs and intelligence systems were implemented in 1933, making Japan more impatient in its attempts to increase influence over the archipelago. The Dutch had seized the Dutch East Indies through a prolonged process starting in the late 16th century. The Dutch East India Company, established in 1602, spearheaded their colonization efforts using military force, alliances with local rulers, and monopolistic trade policies. By the 18th century, the Dutch dominated the spice trade, employing a divide-and-conquer strategy among indigenous kingdoms. Despite brief British control during the Napoleonic Wars, the Dutch regained their holdings through the 1814 Treaty. The Netherlands clung to neutrality, but in May 1940, Germany invaded the country. The Dutch government fled to London, setting up a government in exile. That evening, the Governor-General of the Dutch East Indies, Tjada van Starkenborg, was informed of the German invasion of the Netherlands. From now on, they were on their own, as there were barely any military reinforcements and goods from Europe available. Facing an impending oil shortage, Japan sought to secure the East Indies oil supply. President of the United States Franklin Delano Roosevelt put an embargo on oil exports to Japan. This led to Japan losing 93% of its oil as it grew increasingly isolated. Fearing a US declaration of war if Japan seized the East Indies, the Japanese orchestrated the infamous attack on Pearl Harbor. War was now inevitable. The East Indies emerged as a crucial target for Japan due to its abundant resources, particularly rubber plantations and oil fields. The colony was the world's fourth largest oil exporter making it strategically important for Japan, which lacked native oil sources. The Dutch government in the East Indies, aware of Japan's intentions, declared war on Japan on December 8, 1941. However, Japan, keen on preventing the Dutch from destroying oil installations prematurely, did not reciprocate until January 11. The ensuing campaign involved General Hisaichi Tarauchi's Southern Expeditionary Army Group targeting key locations like Borneo and initiating a three-pronged assault on the East Indies to capture vital oil resources. On December 17th, Japanese troops landed in Miri, a key oil production center in northern Sarawak, supported by a warship, aircraft carrier, three cruisers and four destroyers. Japan continued the offensive with air raids on crucial positions, gaining air superiority. Landings occurred at various locations between December 15, 1941 and January 19, 1942. The plan was to expand southward, seizing oil reserves in the Dutch East Indies. The eastern, center and western forces aimed to conquer strategic points, with the eastern force advancing towards Jolo, Davao City, Celebes, Ambon and Timor. The center force targeted Tarakan and Balikpapan, while the Western force attacked Palembang's oil refineries and airfields. The coordinated defense against Japan led to the formation of the American-British-Dutch-Australian Command at Surabaya. 
Admiral Thomas Hart was appointed as commander of the Navy. Despite collaborative efforts, differing strategies among English, Dutch, American and Australian commanders complicated the joint defence. English priorities focused on safeguarding Singapore and the eastern entrances to the Indian Ocean, Americans and Australians were cautious about advancing into Southwest Asia, and the Dutch emphasized defending Java and Sumatra as crucial points. Facing superior Japanese numbers, the naval forces included ships from the US Asiatic Fleet, British, Australian, and Dutch units. The Japanese, with significant naval and air power, swiftly advanced through the region, capturing key locations like Tarakan, using it as a forward airbase to capture Balikapan a week later. On February 15th, the Japanese captured Singapore, throwing command into serious disorganization. Hart left Java for Serilon, leaving Vice Admiral Konrad Helfrich in charge of the remnants of Abda's fleet. The surface fleet fell under the command of Rear Admiral Carol Dorman. Admiral Dorman, 52 years old, was a seasoned Dutch naval officer with a background in aviation. Since 1940, he commanded the Dutch fleet forces in the East Indies. The island of Bali became a linchpin in the region. Its proximity to Java and its vital airfield Denpasar made it a likely target for the rapidly advancing Japanese. As Japanese forces had gained control over airfields in Balikpapan, they also conquered parts of Celebes, Dutch Borneo, and by February, they landed on Sumatra, fostering a revolt in Archer. Despite some resistance, the majority of Allied naval and land forces succumbed to the Japanese onslaught within two months. By mid-February 1942, Bali indeed became a key target for Japan to ensure success in the final offensive on Java. Despite offering little to Japan's development, Bali's occupation was deemed essential for its strategic advantages in maintaining air superiority and controlling vital straits. In preparation for the invasion of Bali, the Japanese concentrated a naval force in Makassar on February 17th with troop transport ships and destroyers led by Rear Admiral Kyuji Kubo. The minimal resistance and intact airfield allowed Japan to claim a strategic victory Simultaneously, intelligence indicated Japanese movements, with sightings off Kendari and Ambon, suggesting an invasion force heading to Bali and a potential threat to Timor. Helfrick and Dorman devised a plan to concentrate Allied forces in the east. De Ruiter, Java, Piet Hein, Courtenay, Ford and Pope would take an Indian Ocean route to Chilachak, while Tromp and American destroyers from Ratai Bay would head to Surabaya via the Java Sea. Misfortune cast its shadow upon the fleet, even as it departed the harbour. The Dutch destroyer Courtenay temporarily lost control of its rudder, grounding itself on one of the Channel shores. Doorman had no choice but to press forward with the mission, leaving the incapacitated vessel behind. Recognising their vulnerable position, Japanese commander Kubo issued orders to expedite the operation. The main force departed for Makassar that evening. Only the transport Sasago Maru and the destroyers Asashio and Oshio remained, tasked with collecting the remaining Daihatsu disembarkation launches used in the Bali attack. The initial Allied squadron, led by light cruisers De Reuter and Java, was followed by Piet Hein at 5,500 yards with the two US destroyers further behind. At 11 p.m. within the confines of the strait, the Java sighted three Japanese ships to port, the Sasago Maru, Asashio, and Oshio, preparing to depart. Java promptly fired star shells to enhance visibility and engaged Asashio at point-blank range, a mere 2,200 yards away. In response, the Japanese destroyers left the transport and turned on their searchlights to look for their adversary. De Ruiter, with its artillery trained to portside, took a moment to open fire, but eventually unleashed its firepower on Oshio. The Japanese destroyers, caught off guard, moved eastward against the Dutch cruisers. Sensing Asashio and Oshio's intent to cross their T, the Dutch cruisers altered course to the northeast in an attempt to clear the area, yet their efforts proved futile. Despite firing only a handful of salvos, 
each Dutch cruiser claimed numerous hits on the enemy destroyers. As the Japanese ships continued their mission seemingly undamaged, Asashio managed to land one five-inch projectile on Java, inflicting minimal damage. The cruisers hastily retreated at high speed while the Japanese destroyers lost contact and steamed southeast. Trailing the Dutch light cruisers and seeing them engaging the Japanese, Piet Hein launched three torpedoes at Sasago Maru and opened fire with its 4.7-inch artillery on the same target. However, now free from the cruiser's fire, Asashio and Oshio closed in on the Piet Hein, retaliating with torpedoes and gunfire. Faced with this onslaught, Piet Hein turned to starboard in a southeast course, launching two torpedoes at Asashio. Both missed. Simultaneously firing its artillery and deploying a smokescreen, Piet Hein attempted to conceal itself from the relentless Japanese assault. Nevertheless, Asashio, at a close distance, struck Piet Hein with two five-inch shells, one on the second mast platform, igniting a significant fire, and the other in the second boiler room. Piet Hein, deprived of propulsion, came to a halt. One of Asashio's long lance torpedoes struck the port side, causing the ship to sink almost immediately. 149 of its crew wouldn't survive to tell the tale. The smoke screens created by Piet Hein shielded Asashio and Oshio from the approaching American destroyers. They fired their port side torpedoes against Sasago Maru, these missed their target. Passing through Piet Hein's smokescreen, the American vessels spotted Asashio, which promptly opened fire on the John D. Ford. Despite retaliating with artillery and launching five torpedoes from the Pope, the Allied ships were compelled to retreat southeast, deploying another smokescreen without sustaining any damage or inflicting harm on the enemy. Asashio and Oshio lost visual contact with the American ships briefly exchanging artillery salvos under the misconception that they were attacking other Allied vessels. Emerging unscathed, they soon realized their error and rejoined to defend and assist the Sasago Maru. Asashio and Oshio, having attended to Sasago Maru, reloaded their torpedo tubes, anticipating a second Allied attack that loomed on the horizon. Upon learning of the Allied ship sighting in the Badung Strait, Admiral Kubo redirected the Arashio and Michishio to leave their transport to support the other two destroyers. A second Allied naval formation, departing from Surabaja, aimed to complement the initial strike force, navigating the Bali Strait and surrounding the south part of Bali. The force entered the Badung Strait by 1 a.m. led by the Stuart, with the Parrot, Pillsbury and John D. Edwards. The Allied ships were unaware of the circumstances surrounding the first strike force. In the ensuing chaotic engagement with Japanese destroyers Asashio and Oshio, Allied torpedoes failed to hit, leading to a retreat to the northeast. At a quarter to 3 a.m., Stuart detected two Japanese ships, resulting in an opportunity for the Allies to fire at Michishio and Arashio. Although all Allied torpedoes missed, Michishio sustained significant damage from the shelling. The Allies retreated to Java's main naval base, Chilajap, and the American destroyer Stuart, damaged in the engagement, ended up capsizing in a floating dry dock. The Japanese later captured Stuart and repurposed it as a patrol ship for the remainder of the war. Piet Hein's fate raised questions, particularly regarding the reasons for its abrupt stop. Officially, Asashio was credited with the hit, but speculation persists that the Dutch ship may have been an accidental target of American destroyers in the vicinity. Possibly momentarily losing contact with Piet Hein, the American destroyers spotted an unknown destroyer moving in the opposite direction, interpreting it as an enemy ship and opening fire before realizing their mistake, potentially too late. The attribution of damages and the sinking of Piet Hein were officially assigned to Asashio, overlooking any alternative explanations. Overall, the Battle of the Badung Strait proved a strategic, material, and tactical defeat for the Allies, losing the island of Bali, and facing subsequent challenges in the Java campaign due to the loss of ships and Japanese aerial dominance. 
The Allies, relying on artillery, underestimated the effectiveness of Japanese torpedoes and lacked proficiency in night fighting, contributing to their overall failure in the operation. Within a week, Dorman would again meet a Japanese fleet, and this time it would be a battle for survival. Thank you very much for watching this video. Please leave a like, it really helps out the channel. If there is a topic, battle or person you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and you want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 per month, you will already gain early access to all my videos without any in-video advertisements. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.